recommend. Yeah. Oh, you're no longer live. Why? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harjeev Singh, and I am the uh, founder and CEO of Gutenberg and the moderator for this panel, The Branding of Nations, The Case of the U.S. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all, and we have an exciting panel and a group of panelists here to jump into a topic which is a, a, a very interesting topic personally for me, partly because I, I run a global branding and uh, marketing agency uh, based out of New York. Uh, and uh, it, uh, let me do a quick round of introductions and then we'll sort of dive into our topic. We have 45 minutes. Uh, each of the speakers will do uh, about five to six minutes of, of uh, a particular theme within the topic. Uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, uh, both for the audience and, and uh, others who want to join in here. It, it is, uh, uh, let me start with uh, Barry Lustig, who is the president of Cormorant Group. Uh, who is joining us from Tokyo, I believe. Uh, and then we also have Christine Kotz here, who is joining us from Amsterdam. She is uh, the CEO of GEMS. Uh, and uh, I, I found something very interesting on, on Christine. I was reading about her. Uh, she is an expert on soul language, which I want to learn more about uh, after, after this session. Uh, we also have Rohan Shetty, an entrepreneur who is based out of Kodai Canal uh, in uh, the south of India who's uh, had an exciting career as an entrepreneur in the shipping business uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing more on that. And of course, Aditya Berlia, who's uh, a multifaceted entrepreneur uh, coming in from New Delhi. Uh, uh, lovely to have all of you. Uh, before we dive in, I thought I would set up some context on branding and, uh, you know, why should nations brand, right? And that's a topic you'll hear a lot about. Uh, you know, there was a, a recent book I read by uh, Robert Schiller, who's a Nobel uh, Prize winning uh, economist, uh, who wrote a, a book called Narrative Economics. Uh, it's about how narratives and stories build brands uh, and have Im impact on markets, and, and uh, particularly when you start to look at uh, financial markets. Uh, and essentially, you know, that's part of the reason why companies do branding. And, and very simply, nation branding, uh, at, at the end of the day, is about using corporate techniques on branding uh, to build a nation's narrative and its perception uh, at a global level, right? It could be for attracting tourism investments or, uh, you know, uh, companies that drive brands for countries as well. So uh, we will be touching on a, a variety of these themes and topics. And on that note, uh, I would love to invite Barry to uh, kick off uh, and and uh, share his perspective, and, and then we'll come to Christine after that. Barry, over to you. Barry, you're on mute. Um, hi, I thank you for uh, your your great introduction. Uh, I have the. I've actually worked on country branding before. I worked on the the branding of uh, Japan uh, early in my career, and I've seen. Uh, firsthand how difficult it is to come to different kinds of consensuses and actually try to define what purpose is. I mean, just as you are saying, the reason to have a global brand is to raise global perceptions of things like culture, governance, uh, people, exports, tourism, investment, immigration, those kinds of things. Um, and of course, they usually, usually these exercises come out because it's a period of kind of redefining or reorienting. Certainly the U.S. could probably use a little bit of that now. Um, and also I think what makes it very difficult is, um, particularly for a large and, and, and multifaceted country, is collective purpose. When you're talking about you know, Japan, um, Thailand we did it very successfully after the economic crisis with uh, 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 amazing Thailand, uh, 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 the most famous example would be uh, cool, Brita cool Britannia, obviously coming from rural Britannia, and that you know that came about uh, in the mid 1990s when Blair came into power um, with New Labour, signifying you know the end of Thatcherism, brutalist architecture, and then cultural reemergence of London. We have Damien Hirst's you know Sharp. We have Wonderwall from Noel Gallagher. Um, which is a real time of, of optimism and also a time when British industry wanted to throw off uh, 
the kind of images of, of clunkiness and poor quality, et cetera. So it, it fit the times. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of criticism um, that came from that afterwards, that it wasn't inclusive. Um, it didn't represent uh, 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 the reality of, of what, where Britain was. Um, you know, and, and I guess part of what makes country branding difficult is, is where does it come from? Uh, who has the authority? A lot of times these kinds of things come from the tourist authority, or in my case, I work with the prime minister's office. Um, you know, and in the case of Japan, you know, there were things like uh, the gross national cool, and you can imagine how that was uh, perceived um, as, uh, um, you know, throughout the world and also within Japan. So, you know, again, I'm kind of rambling here, but, you know, who is your audience? What do you actually want to, what do you want to happen with your brand? I mean, why are why does, you know, why do go through it and then who participates and who can exclude? I think everyone is going to say, well, my group wasn't included or for the U.S., you know, why are the blue states and people like me defining what goes on in red America when we have any idea as to what's going on or why does one specific group or one specific gender, et cetera, have mm -hmm. over influence over, over others. So, um, you know, there's always going to be a lot of controversy. Everyone's going to be, is, is going to feel um, slighted in some way. But I also have seen as a practical matter and trying to get it out, get, get a campaign out the door or principles is that when everyone is part of something, then the concept becomes so muted that it has no power. So there is a real contradiction there as well. Um, just the actual work that comes out, the slogans that come out, the kind of support that comes with it um, becomes meaningless uh, if there's no kind of collective vision. And I think in the case of the US, that's gonna be harder and harder because the country is so divided. Um, you know, where it worked probably best was, was in uh, uh, Thailand after the crisis, um, the tourism authority actually hit upon something I probably didn't mean to, uh, amazing Thailand. And that's because Thailand at the time was, was defying all expectations as to the growth of industry, the kind of uh, collective, again, a kind of collective purpose at the time. Now, of course, it was the reds and the, and the yellows and everyone hates each other. But um, at the time, there was a sense of building uh, Thailand back and, 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 and putting forth its, its, its cultural uh, uh, presence in the world, its, its, its welcoming uh, nature, and, and also just a general sense of optimism. It's still used. Now, now that Thailand is so divided, the politics are such a mess that, that uh, Amazing Thailand has fallen back into just being a simple tourist slogan that is like anything else. Um, so it's really difficult, you know, where, you know, it depends on what you want to do with it. And again, inclusion and, and authority. But that's, again, we'll, we'll talk all about that um, over to other people. Sure. Th thank you for that, Barry. And I, I know, I, I think while we are going to be spending some time about uh, to just discussing uh, the U.S., brand as it stands today and, and on that note i'd like to uh, ask christine to share her view because uh, you know there, there, there's a heated debate about how the world outside perceives america right and, and there's a lot of division that's viewed uh, particularly in the last five six years uh, christine what are your sort of thoughts on, on sort of what are the driving elements of of the u.s brand uh, i know you talk about how your own uh, personal family uh, you know, uh, you're using a lot of these tech platforms and Tesla. So I'd love to hear sort of what, what your take is on how the U.S. is perceived. You're on mute, uh, Christine. I don't know. My computer takes its own way today. Hey, Barry, thank you very much for laying down the path. It's really interesting what you bring to the panel, I think, and to the discussion. And easy for me to follow up. You know, if you if you talk about collective purpose, I I think it's it's quite right to also bring into scope um, the word ownership, hmm? because um, 
where is the brand owned? And and then I jump directly to um, what you heard you said. You know, I come from today. I come from my personal perspective as a, as a citizen here in Europe, as a mother to three sons, and as a professional of a boutique firm with only globalists. And here's my second point. You know, why can you build a niche firm um, successfully? Of, of the globe because you share the same values. And here is one thing that we hit upon our head hard uh, in the American society. It's divided as never before. And coming back to uh, what I've brought to the table also in our preparations, you know, the, the only real thing what I can think of as in, in terms of branding, still telling my sons, 16, 18, 20, you know, open to the world, um the american dream i opened i went into our tv room yesterday you know what was up on youtube 10 worst states in america than most racist states in america and i think that's reality you know so when we think of a nation and america is as far as i know correct me i can make dumb faults um but america is is the nation brought together by all kinds of different states. That to me makes it extremely difficult to brand a nation. On top of that, we still, you know, their first big branding of the American dream was so huge together with their soft power, their, their power of soft power. It's hard to redo that, including the memory of the traumatic experiences that we have on the political side with the last administ administration. Um, saying that the political, cultural layer and context behind the nation's branding is extremely important. To me, on top of that, um, there is this state's nation versus city you know cities like new york city they have their own brand how to incorporate um new york washington boston where we all like to go right uh chicago and then on the other hand all the all the all the cities that i don't even know and i come back as a mother my my boys know all of them but we all know this the story about detroit it's 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 widely divided to heal this, if I may use that word, I would say every nation needs to learn their solution, you know, their inner truth. Because no matter the, 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 the degree of how America is divided, I still think they, they have a, a set of common values, but they don't steer on it. Common values like freedom. Hmm? Um, I'm not saying political preferences. I say freedom. I say being the big friends and how relevant today for Europe and, and other powers. Um, but also um, um, inclusion, diversity. And then I come back, uh, Hajif, on, on you know the identification of youngsters with America. America brought everything, brought my Tesla outdoor, brought my iPhone, brought, you know, um, it's hard to ignore that. I don't know if that is a soft power. I know it's a power and I know it's a friendly power. That's what I want to say. There, There is uh, lots of work to do and on branding level, to me, it seems one of the most complex situations to brand. Um, if I may leave it like that here for the moment if somebody wants me to say something more but sure here's my now let's, uh, no I, I think you make uh, some very good points christine i, I think uh, one of the key sort of uh, things that i'm hearing is nations are made up of cities of, of people of uh, a lot of cultural artifacts of companies and a variety of things and each of them have their own narratives that drive right and uh, i think uh, coming to Rohan now, because Rohan did bring up in our prep uh, discussions, you know, uh, the example of uh, city-states like Dubai and sort of the role they play uh, in, in terms of shaping their narratives. 
Jerome, over to you. I, I know it's a good uh, pickup point from what where Christine left uh, left us. Thank you, thank you, Hajiv, and um, yeah, good to be here. Um, yeah, to, to take off from that, I mean, you know, there's an anecdote we talk about. Uh, who are we? Animals with rules, human beings, animals with rules, tribals. Are we part of a tribe? We cling to that uh, tribal identity, and then over the years, over generations, you know, we've built on that. And I think, uh, you know, our nature is to be one up. I'm better than you. I, I mean, uh, you know, that I could generalize, but so when you talk about stuff like that, we talk about shared values, we talk about shared culture, we talk about shared history. Now, history, you know, is written by whom? <laughs> Not necessarily the people who uh, ought to have written it, right? But that's the way it is. And then we move forward. So when we talk about narrative, you know, uh, I, my perspective is uh, like you talked about you know, what, do we, what do we need to achieve? Why do we need to brand? Do we really need to at all? I think to live peacefully, we would need to, because uh, I, I would think life would be very boring if everyone's just the same. I mean, you know, that's that's diversity and that's excitement. And that asymmetry is what I feel uh, causes, you know, that that's what you know results in the need to brand. Now, how you brand, it's, it's a different thing altogether. That we need to, I think one would, the, I mean, you know, be wearing a jacket today, right? I could very well uh, wear, wear a shirt. It's, it's the image projection for whatever purpose, be it for a soft purpose like culture or stuff along like that, or human values, or at a hard purpose, like I'm the biggest, toughest policeman in the world, right? and so on and so forth. So, so once it is decided that we have a narrative, then an execution of that process you know, folks such as you guys, you guys are professional branding experts, right? Okay, you you carry on the story. And my uh, issue with this is, you know, almost every single time after a period of a couple of years, reality, expectation, and the narrative are completely different. And that's when you have uh, the, the challenges. Okay, America, yeah, the American dream, land of the free, uh, and so on and so forth. Is it? So, People need to ask hard questions. I believe it is important to brand. I believe it. Yes, I agree with you that, you know, in a, I mean, I'm, I'm of South Asian Indian heritage, right? I mean, India is not one country. It's an idea. It's a huge melting pot of a whole range of different people. But there is something in common, you know, probably a value system and so on and so forth. And I think our perception of the United States, because that's the purpose of this session, is that it was a great idea. And it can be and continue to be a great and better idea. But somewhere along the line, like any process, any company, any life, you know, you have these ups and downs. So long as we have a system to address the downs and an and, and open mindedness that, you know, you know, guys, we're not as good as we think we are. Maybe we are, we are losing sight of our narrative. We are losing sight of the course we set out uh, to get on. Then I think, uh, you know, you can. You can come back to what your dream was and how you articulate to you know whoever. I mean, why do people? Why do immigrants? So we were at lunch today. We were talking about visas, getting visas. You know, so the uh, said, "Oh, can, uh, Canada, Canada. Oh, it's very easy for me to get a visa." I said, "Why? Oh, because I've got a son and I've got two grandchildren there." I said, "If you tell that to an American visa officer, he says you got family there. Oops, nope, no entry. Two different, same continent." Two different value systems. I mean, uh, so she asked me why. I said, I, I don't think people want to go to Canada because it's too cold, but I think they, they like the US for whatever reason. People still want to go, irrespective. So that asymmetry, uh, you know, uh, be it, uh, it could be from a, you know, economic migration, it could be for family reasons, it could be for any reason. Why do you aspire to go somewhere else because of the story and the image and the narrative that you have received over a period of your life? So it is very, very important how it's done. I think it needs to be a bit fluid. We need to adjust ourselves as time go along. Uh, if we cast our story in stone, we're going to have a challenge because how do we adapt to the world changing all around us? I mean, that's my start off uh, um, comment of the session. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for that, Rohan. Uh, and, and I think 
you you highlight a few very interesting points, right? So are, are these narratives being built based on strong proof points? You know, in the branding business, you don't really create a narrative unless you have something very valuable uh, underlying why a, a particular positioning is taken or uh, to be sort of technical about the marketing side of this, right? Uh, you don't want to build a brand uh, and uh, hypothetically, right, you don't want to build a brand for a dictator uh, based on democratic values. It makes no sense. It's counterproductive uh, for a brand uh, of that sort to happen. Uh, but I think uh, you, you lead into a very important point and, and uh, I, I think it leads into what Aditya's uh, questions were on this, which is, you know, Aditya, you talked about sort of uh, branding and, and disinformation in, in the modern era because a lot of people are, and, and we're seeing a massive information war happening as we speak with the whole Ukrainian crisis, right? On both sides, it's it's uh, it's, it's. I mean, I, I parse media for for a living, so I, I see this. It's it's very very uh, interesting, uh, but would love to hear your thoughts at the end, and then we'll sort of open it up for a, a deeper discussion on on some of these points all of you have raised. Thank you so much, Harjeev. You know, one of the big things which I love. Uh, when we address large topics like this is to try to break it down into first principles. <clears throat> if you really see, and you know, I, I go back to Yuvan Harari on this, you know, how the, uh, the difference between how human beings are separate from animals fundamentally is for us to be able to have shared myths. If I am uh, an American citizen or an Indian citizen, I meet another one all the way across the world, don't know him, but by virtue that we share that same myth, we will help each other. We feel bonded to, uh, uh, together. And this is how we are able to create these massive societies, hundreds of millions of people who have nothing in common often as individuals, but come together as a shared myth. And that's how you create um, a national identity. Brands to me, particularly outside, extends a country's shared myths beyond its nationals and its own residents. And this is super powerful. Because brands, we identify with them. I identify with this country and their brand. They speak for us and with us. So-and-so country said this, yes. You know, this is I believe in. I believe in, in what they're saying. They are speaking to me. They're speaking for me. And we fight for them. Even if they're not ours. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a whole bunch of this. Let's go fight in Ukraine. Foreign Legion stuff happening. That's a power of creating that shared myth and belief. And, and that brand against, for and, uh, and against. But also, if you don't like a brand, you stand against it. And so fundamentally for me, the entire concept of brands of that shared values is an immensely powerful. In fact, I would say the entire world today is nothing but a clash of brands, whether it's a country level, individual level, uh, people level. But then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what does that mean for us? And here's my argument. Every country has a brand, whether it likes it or not. By virtue of existing, by virtue of having a shared myth, you have a brand. But the big question is, are you in control of it? Are you actively managing it? And as my fellow panelists have, have, have clearly alluded to, can you actually manage it? You know, do you even have the capability to say that I can control the, control the narrative of my brand? And there are fundamentally three basic issues. First, if you, if you really look 20, 30 years ago, countries could have massive internal disagreements. And this is something, you know, and I, I worked with some people in China on, we've looked at some other countries, where you can have massive internal disagreements, say something different to your people, but then have a unified front to the public, to the outside your country. Maintain your brand, internally you keep fighting. That's gone. All your internal dirty laundry, everything you talk to, all your existential crises are now part of your brand. It all comes out. You can't sort of cover what's happening internal by having a very active external brand. The second problem, which is something the United States is facing, unfortunately, with its brand, actions speak louder than words. Very nice. You have this brilliant branding strategy. Your president is on point. Your Congress is on point. You're repeating it again and again and again. And everybody's there. And then you go do something completely different. And you do it again. And you do it again. And people suddenly say, you know what? Uh, your brand is what you do, not what you say that you want to do or not what you say that you aspire to do. And the last bit is, can you deliver consistency? Great. You said this. Year after year, brands are built on consistency. 
That's how you trust in brands. That's how you believe this is the brand. Can you be consistent? And unfortunately, for better or worse, the U.S., particularly in the last 20 years, every time an administration changes, it's like, whoa, full reset. You know, your, your allies start switching. What you stand for starts uh, switching. That continuously, that consistency of messaging gets broken. And so it's really hard. Now, with regards to Brand USA, we have had, and I'm, I can say, you no, know, we've talked about the American dream, freedom, democracy. These were historically the brands. Even if they didn't do actions and words, it was still consistently maintained. But for the last five years, I think we can all agree, I don't think Americans believe in that more. No, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I lived there for many years. I'm well in touch with them. And all my social feeds are, okay, we are an imperialistic power. We are racist. Uh, we are freedom is, you know, for the elite, uh, you know, drain the swamp. Everything is there. Our democracy doesn't work. Honestly, looking from the outside, having lived in Asia, having lived in other countries, I look at them and say, this is first world people's problems. My God. I, I, I don't think you guys really see what dysfunctional societies look like. But when you have an entire country rethinking of what it stands for and can it deliver it for its own people, it's very hard for them to, uh, to stand together and to do that as a brand. Now, what has been very good and easy? And where do I see uh, the U.S. can do? One, certainly I see, and you know, Christine covers one covered this as well. Uh, the U.S. is massive, right? So if you have an economy like California, it's not just a state in the U.S., it's a top 10 global economy, right? California has its own brand. When you buy an Apple product, it doesn't say designed in the U.S. It says designed in California by Apple, right? Texas has its own brand. Brand Texas exists from music, from food, from there. And today you can go into many places and say, hey, what's brand Texas? And, you know, people would say this is brand Texas, and I've loved what, what two states, Georgia and South Carolina, have done. They have taken an active reason to say, you know what, we don't want to be branded by the U.S. And they've sent delegations all across the world to establish brand Georgia, brand South Carolina. This is what we stand for. This is what our people stand for. And what's lovely and interesting about the U.S. is that every state and every city, the economies are so large that they can actually exist as independent brands in the world way above what happens in, in the United States. And so I said the great opportunity for the U.S. is while it's going through this external struggle and the internal struggle at the same time to brand itself and figure out what it's doing, I think the leadership can be taken by individual cities and individual states. And like I said, whose economies are large enough, uh, more than most European countries, more than more Asian countries, uh, uh, to really have their own soft power. The two major things where I see where states and cities uh, can match because what they can do is they can't change where they are. They are in the United States. So the U.S. brand keeps going on, right? But they can say, we, we disagree with it when they want to. Hey, the U.S. is doing all of this. Very nice. New York disagrees, right? And come to New York, visit New York, invest in New York because we stand for this. And that, I think, over time at a local level can be a lot more consistent. And so I don't think, you know, when, so when we talk to people in South Carolina, I ask, you know, hey, you're telling us to invest in this, et cetera. What can you guarantee? The U.S. will change its mind every time. They'll sanction a bunch of people. They'll put a bunch of laws. And they say, look, we can't guarantee what the United States will do, but we can guarantee what South Carolina is doing. And we've done it for the last 20 years and do it for the next 20. And so this hyper localization of stability that's happening in the U.S. is, I think, a wonderful thing. And I think that's where the U.S. can start building out particularly tourism and investment brands. And I'll stop here, Ajeev. A lot of interesting stuff to talk about why brands matter, you know, how they empower not just soft power, but people. You, know, you see someone from a country, you make assumptions. Companies, I am, I am incorporated here versus incorporated somewhere else. A product, this was designed and manufactured here versus the other. And so it's not just about you know, geopolitics or perception. It fundamentally impacts individual lives. And countries have responsibility to their citizens to at least try to actively manage what they stand for, even if you are the U.S. and it's terribly hard. Thank you for that, Aditya. I, I, I think uh, you had on some very important uh, points there as well. Uh, any, uh, Barry, Christine, Rohan, any, any comments, any threads on any of these points so far? And then I'd also like to invite uh, the audience, if any of them have 
uh, any questions. And uh, my good friend Jerry is here. Jerry, good to see you there. Uh, Alexander, Daniel, if any of you have questions, just sort of raise your hand and, and uh, would love to hear your questions as well. Barry, any any points from uh, any yeah, I think follow I'd up like points? To, to sure. Address both uh, Christine and Aditya. Um, I think Christine and I are in the same business. Um, we're in the people business, and we get to see uh, in the headhunting business. We get to see what people really want and what people really do. It's really people don't like us, but we get to see a lot. Um, and I think we both have probably seen the disambiguation of the moral authority from the U.S. versus what people want from the U.S. That is, they want their Tesla, they want their apples, they want their vacations there, they want the lifestyle that the U.S. pours. But believing in what the U.S. stands for in terms of opportunity for, you know, our, you know, our, our democratic values, et cetera. I think that, again, I think it's important to kind of separate things. We can talk about Brand Georgia or, or whatnot, but I think that overall, people still want to come to US universities. People still want to live in New York City. They may not believe in the US collective force of good, but they still want what we have. Um, so I think that, you know, we have to figure out what, what, we, what we're trying to get at when we're thinking about brands. Some parts of the US brands is quite broken, but other parts are quite intact. And I think that we'll see, again, people moving with their feet when they talk to us about where do you want to live or, or what do you, where do you want to see your personal future? The US still comes on, on the map um, quite uh, dominantly. I, I would imagine, Christine, do you, do you see that in your business? Well, I, I think picking up and from the last introduction, and um, um, you mentioned perception is not the thing. I think perception is the thing. Um, and and what I also hear is, um, and going back to Barry, the uh, collective set of values. Um, so we speak, I think we speak across and the whole nation on values and so forth. Then we speak on states, cities. Um, and then nationwide. Now, it's it's while I hear you all talking, I think it's actually the most beautiful invitation to to build a strong strong brand. You know, once once they and once America can find the common values, and I think there are joint and common values to bring out to the world this mosaic. You know and very different from their first round and yeah, uh, with the great American dream. Now bring together what, what, what real people in real, in real places and spaces um, are, and, and that is a, it's a big puzzle. And how to collectively bring that forward, I would say, hey, Joe, there is an opportunity. Aditya, you wanna? Add, add to that. I just realized I didn't answer your question. Uh, so, so 30 seconds on that. I think one of the challenges that any large brand pro provides, you know, I, I love Barry, you know, sort of mentioned Thailand, for example, is a, is a great brand. I mean, India had incredible India. Uh, uh, for example, UAE has been branding Expo for the last five years. No one can tell me where the last Expo was, but they can tell me this one's in Dubai. Right? And so you have these, these, these large brands. But, but when your brand becomes large enough, uh, in today's age, there's a large number of actors who have an agenda to 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 knock down your brand, to rebrand you. So, so it's not just a thing about, oh, I want to brand myself as that. I have to actively fight against a whole bunch of actors who are trying to brand me as something else. And, you know, we see that we, we see that ha traditionally in the Cold War and we're seeing it now with the huge amount of disinformation. Uh, we see it in, in a lot of the terrorism hotspots. This is what the U.S. stands for. This is what they really stand for. Here is Abu Ghraib, brand U.S. freedom, Abu Ghraib picture. Don't believe them. This is brand U.S., right? And I think part of what the struggle that countries have, but a lot of countries have had this, China has this all the time, is that if, if they're not able to deliver on their promises of their aspirations and their enemies, the people who have their uh, agendas there, they're going to come in and then they're going to say, here's an opportunity for me to actively work against your branding. 
And so it works both ways. It's people calling you out on your throats and saying, hey, you said this, but you're doing, but actively creating disinformation. You might have done the right thing, but someone had a better disinformation branding engine that took what you did and spun it or just came up with a bunch of lies. So it's an active problem. It's not just something that you can say, hey, brand agency hired, one PR campaign, we can go home. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, did you have a question? So you can you hear us, Jerry? I think he's supposed to, uh, you, he's supposed to take, pick up the mic. All right. Click on the mic. All right. Ah, he's gone. Right. Let me try this again. Oops. Would, do you want to type in the question, maybe, if uh, if if he can't get the yeah. chat going? He wants the mic. Daniel, he wants the mic. Daniel wants the mic, I think. There we go. Daniel wants the Daniel wants the Let me try if uh, Daniel's works. I can... It says getting ready for the stage. Uh, Daniel, you should have it in a second. There you Hi. go. Hi, hey, Daniel. Daniel. How are you? Hi. I'm actually born and raised in New York, where I am now, though I usually work in, in the former Soviet Union. So I thought one of the amazing, interesting points uh, that was made was, yes, Americans are complaining about all this stuff. These are, quote unquote, first world problems. And they should really go and see. <laughs> I do agree. I do agree. But I have to say, as a person who was born in the early 70s and grew up here, there was optimism when I was growing up. There was we're number one. We were taught we were number one. And we were in lots of things. Okay. And there was, you're going to live better than your parents and everything. Starting around 2000, I noticed the change. 2001. And uh, I just can't help shake the feeling of decline, especially when I go abroad and I see infrastructure, leapfrogging and things like this. So I, I still think that the U.S. is going to remain this so-called American fantasy, American dream, so to speak, because there's no real competition. But I just can't help feeling decline in lots of areas. And I'm wondering, you know, do you guys see that uh, around the world or how do you feel about that, that uh, the, the, the U.S. is in decline and uh, and maybe some of the aura is a little, I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just, it's a fascinating question for me. How is that perceived around the world? And how would you deal with that? Aditya, you want to go and then Jerry would Yeah, to hear very your quickly, Daniel, you know, you know, I think, I think this, that's the wrong question, quite frankly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it's not whether the, the, the U.S. is in, 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 in decline or not. I think the problem that happened since, since 2000 and uh, since, since 2000 was a lack of agreement in the American society, even among the elites. What does I America think. stand for now? Right. And, and, and so when you have 1972 to 2000, this is what we stand for. This is our benchmark. Are we achieving it? Yes. And then in 2000, the U.S. stopped achieving some of those benchmarks, right? In arguably in a lot of different things. Do you still hold that old branding to be true? This is what we stand for. Or do you find something different and then hold those two uh, uh, in those uh, uh, benchmarks? In many ways, yes, the U.S. has maybe poor infrastructure and crappy airports compared to China or you know, UAE, etc. But in many ways, it is reformed and it's light years uh, ahead of so many countries when it comes to understanding social constructs and issues, when it comes to really debating things that are truly important. And so I wouldn't say decline. I think it's more of an internal introspection that unfortunately, because it's a superpower, it's, it's you know, overpowering the rest of the world as the America figures out its own internal problems. You know? and, uh, but I, 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 see, you know, I see a consensusness coming in five to 10 years where we might have something better here. Jerry, anything you want to add? Oh, <clears throat> I was going to raise the issue of China and its branding. Uh, the Olympics, big investment, <laughs> didn't seem to uh, uh, have an impact. Maybe it had an impact in the rest of the world, certainly not in the United States. So talk a little bit about where's China headed with this brand, or does it really care about a brand? Is it focused internally and doesn't matter? Any, Ron, do you want to take that? 
I think um, China cares a lot about its brand. Uh, it's very, very important. It's what uh, it's. I mean, it's hard to uh, put them in a box, but it's pretty obvious what you can't do in China. So uh, there, uh, and it's also again what what you guys consider Asia. Um, uh, you know, loss of face. So when you have a culture where you have loss of face as a key part of your social construct and beyond, you you have to care about your brand. Now, whether you're doing a good job or not, that's uh, left to be seen. I, I think the recent Olympics uh, and the situation around it is an aberration. Uh, you know, is an aberration because when you have what for all practical purposes an autocratic type of society, um, it's also relatively easy to manage it because you are, you are, you are controlling dissent and you're controlling debate and you're controlling a lot of information flow. So they do care about the brand and, uh, and, and, uh, and that's translated into how they manage the narrative out there. You know, it's because they do care now, whether it's a, r a right way or the wrong way, that's a separate thing altogether. And on, on uh, Daniel's point of uh, decline, you know, everything for, for everything that goes up, it has to come down. It's just a matter of, you know, a moment in time. And, uh, you know, from the, uh, you know, what do we say in finance, right? If America sneezes, everyone gets affected. So um, you may not like it, but tough luck. They are still the preeminent, uh, you know, power in the world today. And they will be for the foreseeable future. Yes, things will change. I mean, my kids are now applying to college, right? So we say, oh, where do you want to go? Australia, you want to go to you? No, 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 California. That's it. Because, you know, digital animation. And so they're very clear, not U.S., California. Because, oh, I want to do Disney, I want to do Pixar. Preeminent brands in the world today. So, yes, um, uh, you know, there are hiccups. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a land of, uh, people always tell me, you should go to the U.S. I said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want, no, no, you don't understand. You will do well. I said, I'm doing well. No, no, no. You will do better. I said, Why? Because it's a land for aspirational folks. It's a land for entrepreneurs. And you, you can succeed, at least at an individual level. So I think it's got, America is got, has got a lot of good, uh, you know, going for it. We just tend to get lost in the details. And I think human nature is to look at negative, but there's so much more positive. Uh, so that's my, you know, take on, on both your comments. Thanks, Rowan. Uh, Christine, uh... You wanted to say something, and then I'll come to it. I think you wanted to add to that. Christina, what do you? Yeah, uh, did we lose Jerry? That's a shame. Um, no, Jerry's um, there. I think it, his video is off. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Daniel, um, I heard you mentioning, and um, we don't have competition for, from the US. Um, I see that differently. It's just the way you measure. You know, um, in my work, we always bridge uh, the US versus Europe or an important part. And um, I think we just need each other for different reasons to become better than the separate parts. That is one thing. So competition is maybe not anymore the way to look at it. Um, I also believe that we, we should look at pillars, you know, cities, schools, states, you know, all that we have discussed today. Those are the diamonds in, in the whole soup, you know, and maybe working from there. And we all agree that we need to work for collectiveness. Um, but I would say, don't be misled, don't be mistaken. America has some good respect for Europe and some good respect also for Asia and perhaps also other parts, but let's limit it to, to these two parts of the world. That's what I want to say. Uh, you Thank very you, quickly, uh, yeah. for, uh, for Jerry's points, you're on time, Jerry. You know, for me, I love China. I, I visited there all the time. I actually visited Wuhan a lot of times. So it was very interesting for me. But but for me, it's it's, it's a country that is struggling with moving from an underdog brand uh, that we have to take the world seriously to transitioning to a to to top dog brand when everybody's taking a pot shot at you. And I think that's where they're sort of sort of having trouble reconciling it. That we want the world to take us seriously. You are you are not giving us enough respect. Now the world is saying we're giving you respect. But now we're going to take pot shots at you because you have to take a responsibility. And I think from a national brand, they're making the transition. It's tough for them. And I think at some point they're going to have to, uh, you know, reconcile that. Well. Um, 
on that note, Aditya, time. I think we're up. Uh, it's 8.45 a.m. U.S. Eastern Standard. Uh, I, as I said yesterday when we were prepping, this, this conversation can go on for hours and days. Uh, I just wanted to sum it up. I think that we picked on a lot of uh, very interesting threads. And, and since this is the case of the U.S., uh, and, and as somebody who resides in the U.S. Uh, for pretty much the majority of the year now, uh, I, I do want to bring to uh, everybody's attention a little bit of a historical context of uh, it's a society, and, and I've spent 30 years of my life here. Uh, it, it's a society that is built on a lot of uh, sort of conversation debates, a lot of debates and very vocal debates. Uh, and, and we should not forget that the same uh, issues of vision and, and arguments happened even at the time of Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, that's nearly 200 years ago. That has not changed. Uh, and I think today everybody has a platform on social media which amplifies that division to Aditya's point on, you know, what feels like disinformation, I think, is a very real debate that society has. And I think Barry mentioned this yesterday. There is a large part of the country that is not the global part of the country, right? And each country has it. And we have it in India. We see it in China. We see it in Russia where you know, there are people who control the levers of power and projection that end up sort of defining what it means to be of that country. And I think we should, on, on that note, keep in mind that there are multiple diverse topics and themes within each country that need to be addressed. And, and it is, uh, the, the one thing we can all agree is it's not an easy challenge to solve when you talk about branding a nation, because it is about these millions and millions of people, Aditya, that you refer to. But uh, what, a, what an engaging, fantastic way for me to start my Friday morning here in New York. And uh, mm-hmm. lovely to meet you all. And uh, hopefully we can continue this conversation uh, later as well. So take care and have a lovely weekend ahead. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, very, Thank you very much, much. Thank all you. of you. Thank you.